Content warning. This episode contains discussion of violence against children and murder. On April 21st, 2021, a nine-year-old girl in Lafayette, Indiana, left her home, and she didn't come back. Police started searching the neighborhood for her and soon made contact with 42-year-old James Brian Chadwell II. It seems unlikely that they knew anything about Chadwell or his extensive criminal history at this point. They probably simply thought he was just another guy in the neighborhood, someone who may have seen something. Chadwell told the officers that not only did he know the girl, but that she had actually been in his house a little bit earlier. But she had left, and he said that he did not know where she was now. The officers took Chadwell at his word and left him to resume their search for the child. And Chadwell, perhaps thinking he had gotten away with something, went back to the child, because he had lied. He knew exactly where she was. She was his prisoner. He had lured her into his house to pet his dog, and then he had attacked her. He hit her in the head again and again and again, growing angrier as the child struggled to fight back. She was strong and determined, but Chadwell somehow managed to get his hands around her neck and he squeezed, choking her. He maneuvered the now weakened child into a headlock and held her there until she fell unconscious. He took her to his basement. We are going to leave out the details of what exactly Chadwell is accused of doing to the girl. We simply don't want to go into the specifics of this horrible crime perpetuated against a child. We can say that what happened was horrific. This was a violent sexual assault. During the ordeal, Chadwell allegedly threatened the girl. He told her he would kill her if she ever told anyone what he was doing to her. Then, someone knocked on his door. It was the police. They had come back. Chadwell got dressed and went to the door, leaving the girl locked in the basement. The officers asked Chadwell if they could come in and take a look around for the missing girl. For some reason, he said they could. Maybe he just figured they wouldn't find her. But they did. They noticed the chain lock on the basement door, and they got curious. So they opened the door and discovered the girl, injured and crying. There were strangulation marks around her neck. Some of the blood vessels around her face had burst, blackening her eyes. Her arms and legs and head were covered with bruises and bite marks. Chadwell was immediately arrested. When his mugshot appeared in the press, some people couldn't help but notice that he strongly resembled the sketch of the suspect in the murders of Liberty German and Abby Williams. Those killings had occurred in the town of Delphi, Indiana, a short drive away from Chadwell's home in Lafayette. Could it be possible that the police had just arrested the Delphi killer, solving the most notorious unsolved crime in the state of Indiana. My name is Anya Kane. And I'm Kevin Greenley. And this is The Murder Sheet, a weekly true crime podcast. Anya and I connected over the Burger Chef murders, a 1978 unsolved case involving the killings of four young restaurant employees. Now we're looking to track restaurant homicides. To help us understand the patterns of these crimes, we created a spreadsheet of nearly a thousand eatery-related killings, the murder sheet. We'll be drawing on that data throughout season one to give you a deep dive into undercovered crimes. We don't just rely on skimming the headlines. We dive into these cases to bring you in-depth coverage. We're the murder sheet, and this is The Delphi Murders, James Chadwell.
On February 13, 2017, Liberty German and Abigail Williams walked across the Monon High Bridge in Delphi, Indiana. Libby even posted an image of Abby making her way along it. A few minutes later, they ran into someone, a man. Libby video recorded at least a portion of the encounter, but only a few moments of it have been released. The man calls them guys and tells them to go down the hill. We don't know exactly what happened next, but police believe that the person you just heard on that snippet of audio killed Libby and Abby. Authorities released grainy images of the man taken from Libby's video, and somewhat confusingly, they also shared two different sketches that are supposed to show what their person of interest looked like that day. Could that person be James Brian Chadwell? Hopes were raised when law enforcement released a statement revealing that they knew about Chadwell and were looking at his possible connection to the Delphi murders. But it is important not to exaggerate the significance of this. The police have received many tips about many people and are obliged to look at them all. Most of them, unfortunately, lead nowhere. And so the mere fact that they are investigating Chadwell's possible connection to the case doesn't mean much. We need to wait and see what their investigation actually reveals before we become excited that the Delphi killer has been caught. We do know, however, that at least as of the time of this recording, the police have found nothing that would make them publicly classify Chadwell as a suspect in the Delphi case. What is in the public record about Chadwell is intriguing but it is far from enough to suggest he is guilty of the murders. We will say this. Anya and I don't personally believe that Chadwell is the Delphi killer, and we'll go into why that is. We will, though, try to lay out all the facts we could gather about him, since there's been a lot of buzz on this lead. Chadwell certainly does resemble the sketches, but the sketches are not photographs. They're not super detailed either. Many, many people resemble the sketches. We think Libby's sister Kelsey summed it up best in a tweet from April 28th. There's a resemblance. Okay. There was a resemblance with Daniel Nations, Charles Eldridge, Paul Etter, Thomas Bruce, and several others. You can see these people in a simple Google search of the girls. They all did bad things, but they weren't our bad guy. Just as a side note, Kelsey's original tweet only included the initials of those persons of interest. We added in their full names for further clarity. Kelsey makes a great point, and it is worth exploring in a bit more detail than what she could fit in a single tweet. Chadwell looks like the sketch, but so did Daniel Nations, a registered sex offender who threatened hikers with a hatchet. He is not the Delphi killer. Police have publicly ruled him out. Charles Eldridge looks like the sketch. He is an Indiana man who got into a sexual conversation with what he thought was an underage girl. Kelsey says he is not the Delphi killer. Paul Edder resembled the sketch. He kidnapped and raped a woman. Kelsey says he is not the Delphi killer. Thomas Bruce looks like the sketch. He took three women hostage at a store in St. Louis. He killed one of them and sexually assaulted the other two. Kelsey says he is not the Delphi killer. So looking like the sketches in and of itself simply does not mean that much. But what about the nature of Chadwell's crime against the child? Does that lend credence to the idea he could be responsible for the Delphi murders? Let's take a quick break from the murder sheet to tell you about a podcast investigating yet another unforgettable crime. The Orange Tree is a seven-part series about a 2005 homicide that happened near the University of Texas at Austin. The murder of 21-year-old Jennifer Cave, who was shot, dismembered, and left in a bathtub at her friend Colton Petoniak's apartment, continues to haunt the area to this day. Like the Burger Chef murders, this case features plenty of twists and turns, including Colton's flight to Mexico with another UT student, 
Laura Hall. Both were later convicted in connection with the crime, although Colton has continued to appeal his verdict and claim innocence. The business student turned convicted murderer now says that he doesn't even remember much about the night Jennifer died. The Orange Tree is reported on and produced by Haley Butler and Tanu Thomas, who were both seniors at the University of Texas when they started this project. Together, Haley and Tanu strive to piece together this tragic story in an in-depth podcast that features audio from courtroom scenes and interrogation rooms, prison phone calls, and exclusive interviews with both the perpetrators and the victim's family. You can binge all seven episodes of The Orange Tree today on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. And now, back to the murder sheet. Before taking a look at what Chadwell did on April 21st, let's examine how his life intersected with the legal system over the last year. In May of 2020, Chadwell's father filed a suit to have Chadwell evicted from the family home. On June 15th, 2020, Chadwell, then homeless, called 911. He reported that he was buzzed and in the trees. Police found him lying under a tree at an apartment complex where he had previously trespassed. He reeked of alcohol, and his speech was slurred. He was cited for trespassing and then sent on his way, presumably to a location in some nearby woods where he had made a camp for himself. On July 15th, he was back at the same apartment complex. This time, he was in the apartment of a woman he had known. The woman told police Chadwell was drinking and angrily punching holes in things. The woman did not care much about the property damage. She just did not want Chadwell to harass her anymore. On August 8th, Chadwell called the police from a convenience store that was a three-minute walk from the apartment complex where he'd kept getting arrested. He said he was thinking of hurting himself. When the police arrived, they found him drunk in the parking lot. He told police he lived there. They told him he did not and arrested him. And then, on April 21st of this year, as we've seen, Chadwell lured a nine-year-old girl to his home and assaulted her. Even on his own turf, it seems like it was a bit of a challenge for him to overpower and subdue a child. The two fought and struggled before he was able to render her unconscious. Abby and Libby were 13 and 14. They were older and stronger than the April 21st victim. And, unlike her, they were taken in a public place, an area where other people could theoretically wander by at any moment. Would a man who could not even overpower a single nine-year-old girl in his own home without a protracted fight be able to capture two older girls with no signs of a struggle? It does not seem to fit. Other than that, some of his background does indeed seem to be consistent with what we would expect to find in the Delphi killer. He has a long criminal record, littered with charges for things like aggravated assault. His brother, Ashley Chadwell gave the Daily Mail more disturbing details. According to Ashley, his brother wants to hurt people and once shoved his wife against the wall with such force that it left a whole body imprint. Looking through Chadwell's Facebook profile, it is possible to find more tantalizing clues. Unsurprisingly, he tended to post angry rants about women how they blamed good guys for everything, fished for compliments on social media, and were a lost cause if they were still single over 34. Just your disturbingly common garden-variety misogyny that's probably in some dark corner of everyone's Facebook feed. Wonder if he thinks women are to blame for his current predicament, being outed as a predator who assaults little girls and facing years in prison. Chadwell also posted many photos of outdoor locations, including bridges. Did Chadwell have a pre-existing interest or fascination with bridges that may have inspired him to visit the old Monon High Bridge at Delphi, where he just happened to run into Abby and Libby? Of course it is possible, but at this point we are so far down the speculative rabbit hole that whatever we come up with doesn't mean much. 
Many people of both sexes post photos of bridges on Facebook. It is not evidence of anything. And unfortunately, domestic violence and misogyny are extremely prevalent. One thing we learned from our research into the Burger Chef case is that areas all have their own share of low-life dirtbag males. These are men, and they are almost always men, who are capable of doing the most heinous acts imaginable to innocents. Most of the time, these men stay just out of sight, hidden just well enough so that we don't have to spend much time contemplating the existence of the monsters that walk amongst us. But when there is an unsolved crime and the town is put under a microscope, we cannot help but see and learn about these men. It can be overwhelming to realize how much evil there is out there, and our minds can instinctively rebel against accepting it. And so, when we see a man as horrible as James Brian Chadwell II, or any of the other predators that have come up in the Delphi investigation, we want him to be guilty of this crime, if only because we do not want there to be an army of evil men out there, each of whom could have plausibly committed the crimes that haunt us. But there is. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Murder Sheet. As always, thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenley, who composed the music for The Murder Sheet, and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. To keep up with the latest on The Murder Sheet, please make sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Murder Sheet, and on Facebook at M Sheet Podcast, or by searching Murder Sheet. If you enjoy listening to The Murder Sheet, please leave us a five-star review to help us gain more exposure and send tips, suggestions, and feedback to murdersheet at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening.